You're welcome to the Performance Python Talk from America Algorithms. My name is Eve Hilpesh. I'm founder and managing director of the Python Quants. As the name suggests, uh, we are mainly doing work in the financial industry, so my examples will be primarily uh, financial, but I think they apply to many, many other areas. Uh, so if you're not from finance, uh, uh, you won't have trouble to translate what I present today to your specific domain area. Uh, before I come to the talk, a few words about me and us. Um, as I said, I'm founding, founder and managing partner of the Python Quants. I'm also a lecturer for math finance at Saarland University. I'm co-organizer of a couple of conferences uh, and organizer of a couple of meetups. I actually all center around Python and quant topics. I've written a book, Python for Finance, which uh, will come out at O'Reilly this uh, autumn. It's already out as an ebook. I will show it later on. And another book, Derivatives Analytics with Python, which will be published by Wiley Finance um, next year, probably. Apart from Python and finance, I like to do martial arts, actually. This is the book, and actually today's talk is based on chapter nine of the Python for Finance O'Reilly book. As I said, it's already out as an early release, as an ebook, and the printed version will probably come out at, uh, yeah, well, let's say mid-November is kind of the date. I'm finished with my editing. I hope O'Reilly will, uh, will come up with the printed or the final version pretty soon. Um, there's also, a course right out now um, on Quantsub, actually, uh, which also covers the topic um, that I, the topics that I present today. Uh, it's a completely online-based one. Maybe you want to have a look when you come from the finance industry. I think then the benefits are the highest here in this area. What we are doing otherwise is at the moment mainly working on what we call the Python Quant platform. We want to provide a web-based infrastructure for Quants working with Python and applying all the uh, all the nice things that I present today. Um, I will show it quickly later on, maybe with a couple of examples. We, we have integrated IPython Notebook there, you have IPython Shell, Easy File Management, Vim Editing. So anything you want to need. In addition, we also provide our proprietary analytics suites, decision and DX analytics on this platform. That's enough about us. Now about the talk. What is this talk about, actually? When it comes to performance critical applications, two things should always be checked from my point of view. Are we using the right implementation paradigm? Sometimes this boils down to what is typically called idioms. And are we using the right performance libraries? I think um, many of you might have heard the prejudice that Python is slow. And of course, Python can be slow. But I think if you're doing it right with Python, Python can be pretty fast. And uh, one of the major means in this regard are performance libraries that are available in the Python world. Um, and I can only briefly touch upon all of these that are listed here. I think there was yesterday uh, the talk by Stefan about uh, Thyson. So about any topic that you see here, you can have uh, complete talks or even complete tutorials for a day or even for a week for some. So it's a complex topic, but uh, my talk is more about uh, showing what can be done. The main approach will be to say, this is what it was before. It was a little bit slow. Then we applied this and that. And afterwards, we see these improvements. We don't go that much behind the scenes. We don't do any profiling during this talk, but you will see uh, in many, many cases when it comes to numerics, Python and these libraries can help in improving performance substantially. Let me come to the first topic, Python paradigms and performance. As I said, uh, what I call paradigm here in this context usually is called idioms, for example. Um, this is just a function that you see here don't try to get the details. This is just a function that I will use regularly and have provided it uh, here in the, in the slides and that you can use it afterwards as well. It's just a function to compare a little bit more systematically different implementation approaches and compare performance a little bit more rigorously, but there's nothing special about that. Let me come to the first use case, a mathematical expression that doesn't make too much sense. We have a square root, we have absolute value, we have uh, transcendental functions in there, and a couple of things that are happening there. Um, you might encounter these or similar expressions in many, many areas, as I mentioned before. In, in finance and math finance, you have these, you have these in, in physics, and you name it in almost any science as of today, you find such or similar numerical expressions. We can implement this pretty easily as a Python function. As you see here, um, it's a single equation, and we translate this mainly in a single line function. Nothing special about that. What we want to do, however, is to apply this particular function to a larger array, to a list object, in the first case with 5,500,000 numbers, actually. 
Um, so this is kind of where usually the computational burden comes in. When you have a huge data set and you want to apply this expression to the huge data set, it's not that uh, the single equation is kind of complex, but it's in the end the mass of the computations that makes it uh, typically slow. So to start working with, we generate uh, indeed a list object using simply a range with 500,000 numbers. And what we then do is to implement another function which uses our regional function f implementing the numerical expression where we have a simple looping. This is the first implementation out of six that I present. So this is a pretty simple, straightforward um, function where there is a, a for loop in there. We have another list object and we just calculate the single, the single uh, values and append the result to the other list object. And the function then returns our list with the results. A second one, second paradigm or idiom, if you like, is to use list comprehension. Uh, actually, the same thing is happening as before, but it's a much more compact way to write the same thing. So we generate in a single line of code the list object by iterating over, over our list object A and collect the results given the values that the function f returns. A little bit more compact, maybe better readable. If you're a Python coder, you might uh, prefer this one. We can also do, and this is quite flexible, I wouldn't suggest to do it in that case, we will see this will be uh, the slowest one, but it's very flexible. When we are working, for example, with uh, classes, objects, where we value derivatives, and derivatives, they have like kind of complex payoffs and so forth, and you can describe these like in a string format, it makes it pretty flexible to provide different payoffs to these classes, and this is, for example, one area where we use it, but typically when we use it, it's only once that we have to evaluate uh, the expression. But here in this case, you might notice that the expression is evaluated per single iteration of the list comprehension. So it's, it's uh, and uh, as we will see, this is a very intense, a uh, compute intense or, or interpreter intense um, um, way to do it, to like every time I iterate over the expression to evaluate it. This will make it uh, pretty slow as we will see. Of course, if you're working in numerics or science, you might be used to the vectorization approach of NumPy. What we can do is kind of implement the same thing, this, uh, this time now on a NumPy ND array object, uh, which is especially designed, of course, to handle such uh, data sets and such uh, data structures. And uh, with a single line of code and using vectorized expressions, we can accomplish the same thing. So now we were working on NumPy ND array objects and using NumPy universal functions uh, to calculate what we're interested in. Pretty similar uh, to the list comprehension syntax, but in the end, we would hope for a speed improvement because this is especially designed to exactly do these kind of operations. Then we can also use a dedicated specific library, which is called NumExp uh, for numerical expressions. Uh, here in this case, we again provide the whole expression as a string object, but in this case, Actually, what happens is that this string object, uh, this expression is compiled only once and then used afterwards. And here again, we are working on NumPy and the array objects. So num expression is especially designed to work on NumPy and the array objects. So in this case, we would also see hopefully some kind of improvement because it's kind of a dedicated specialized library to uh, attack uh, these kind of problems. Uh, you might have noticed that in the first example, I have set the number of threads to one, to have kind of a benchmark value. We're only using one thread, one core in this case. Here, I increase the number of threads to four. So if you have a four core machine, uh, you would expect here kind of an improvement. But what kinds of improvement? Let us have a look. In summary, again, we have six different paradigms or idioms used uh, with Python. And in the end, this is kind of delivering, in any case, the same result. So like, as is often the case, and when you see people coming uh, from other languages, um, coming to Python, being new to Python, not knowing all the idioms, they're using probably those that they're used to from other languages, like C or C++, you name it. And, and sometimes this can be a pitfall in the sense that uh, they're using maybe the wrong paradigm, the wrong idiom. But let's have a look what the differences are. Now our comparison function comes into play. And we have a clear winner, obviously. We have a multi-threaded version, it's F6 was the last one, where we're using multiple threads to evaluate the numerical expression on the array object. Then we have the single-threaded one, which is the second fastest, and the third one is uh, the NumPy version. Um, and then the Python ones follow after that. So we see actually there's kind of a 
given the list comprehension, for example, we have a 28 times increase in performance using the multi-threaded NUMIX version. Uh, and as I mentioned already before, the F3, this was the one uh, which uses the uh, built-in eval function of Python. You see that we have a speed up in total here of 900 times. So these can vary, of course, depending on the number of threads they're using and so forth. But the, method, the message, I think, should be clear. Uh, we have in Python many, many ways to attack the same, the very same problem. And all the ways will yield the same results but there might be considerable performance improvements when going the right route and um, avoiding pitfalls and especially avoiding yeah, implementations that are per se compute intensive. So this is, for example, where profiling would come into play. I don't, I don't present it here. I said my approach is more like this is before, then we do something, we compare it, and this is what is afterwards uh, observed. But profiling, of course, would have revealed that eval is kind of a very time-consuming function and most time is spent, for example, with F3 in this type of, uh, of implementation. Let me come just briefly to a rather subtle thing. Uh, when we've seen the numerical algorithms implemented based on NumPy and the array objects, be it directly by the use of NumPy universal functions or by using num expression, uh, have been the fastest. Uh, but there's kind of, uh, in certain circumstances, I, and I encountered that uh, quite a while ago, and it was first like, a little bit like, I didn't know what was going on in there. Uh, but later on, it became pretty clear what was going on. So it's, uh, from my point of view, worth mentioning, depending on the specific algorithm that you're using, that memory layout can play, indeed, a role when it comes to the performance. Uh, let me start with uh, a typical NumPy ND array object, um, which we instantiate by providing the D-type, here in this case, float64, and here the order or the memory layout comes into play. We have two choices with NumPy. There's C for C-like uh, layout and F for Fortran-like layout. Here in this case, you don't see any difference. There's nothing special. You see just the numbers printed out, but don't get confused because this is just a graphical representation of what data is stored actually at the moment. But if we have a, an array like this, you can explain what memory layout uh, is all about, actually. Uh, when we have to see, like, it has row-wise storage. We provide here the order C. Uh, this means that the ones, the twos, and the threes are stored next to each other. So this is how in memory, I mean, memory is a one-dimensional thing. So we only can store it uh, given a unique location in memory. So we don't have kind of uh, two-dimensional, n-dimensional things where we can store data into. It's kind of a linear thing. So we have to decide how to put multi-dimensional thing, things into memory. And this is how is it stored when you use the order of C. Using the order F, then in this case we have a column-wise storage, which means that the one, two, three, the one, two, three, and the other one, two, threes are stored next to each other. Working with such small NumPy and the array objects doesn't make uh, that that much of a difference. But when you come to larger ones, and in particular to asymmetric ones, like this one, where you see we have three times uh, 1.5 million elements in there, then we can expect some differences in performance. Uh, we essentiate two different ND array objects here, the one with the order C, of course, and the other one with F, to just compare it. And when we now start calculating sums, for example, with the C order, you see already kind of a difference when you're calculating the sums over the different axes. So NumPy is, of course, aware of the axes. Uh, list objects, when you construct like uh, two-dimensional things with list objects, there's no awareness, or so there's kind of no attribute um, for the axis. But here in this case, we can calculate the sum row-wise or column-wise, if you like, and you see there's kind of a huge difference here, like a 50% difference when it comes to the two different axes. Only the performance of calculating the sum. Uh, the one delivers back kind of 1.5 million one-dimensional result, the other one returns a result which has only three elements in this case, but of course the numerical operations are running uh, differently uh, over memory for both cases. For standard deviations, you observe uh, the same thing. So uh, according uh, to the results here, uh, going along axis one, which means the second axis, of course, with the zero numbering is much, much faster than the other way around. So if you have these problems and you have to implement, it might be worth considering really, does it make sense to have a three times 1.5 million array or 1.5 million times three array? So you will see considerable performance improvement going the one way or the other, depending on what you are exactly interested in when it comes to the calculations. Um, third sums with the, the F order and the array object. You see 
these operations are actually both slower. They are absolutely slower than the C order operations, but you see different relative performances. So in this case, uh, doing the sum according uh, or along axis uh, zero, which means the first axis, is faster relative to the other axis. Um, the same actually holds true. Not really, this is pretty close for the standard deviations, and you see um, this is also the absolute disadvantage might be due to the fact that C is the default and the C world in, in NumPy is a little bit more maintained or more important. But once you have to, for example, interact with the Fortran world and you are like um, required, so to say, to work with the F order, then it might make sense again to consider the question is three times 1.5 million better or 1.5 million times three. So you will see in certain cases um, huge differences. Let me come to another approach, which is usually, and I think all the approaches that I present today are like, in a certain sense, low-hanging fruits. There's typically not that much involved when it comes to, for example, uh, the redesign of the algorithm itself. So I don't do any redesigns of algorithms. Uh, I'm always sticking to the same uh, problem, to the same implementation, and then showing what it can do. Uh, sometimes you will see that, of course, uh, using different libraries, you need to rewrite something, but it's not about the, uh, for example, parallelization of a certain algorithm. What I will present now, it's more like, given a certain implementation of an algorithm, what can I do with parallel computing, actually? And as I already announced before, uh, I'm, uh, I'm used to use these financial examples, and here is a, a Monte Carlo problem, which uh, is about the simulation of the plex Gold's merton uh, stochastic differential equation, which is kind of a standard geometric Brownian motion, which is also applied in many, many other areas in physics and so forth. And what we want to do is kind of simulate this model and value a European call option. Don't worry about the details. It's only to say that this is usually kind of a very compute-intensive um, algorithm to work with and that might benefit usually from parallelization. But first, the implementation of the algorithm. What I do here is kind of already a, I wouldn't say optimized implementation, but at least I'm using NumPy and using vectorization approaches to be faster than, for example, the typical Python looping that we have also seen as, um, as an alternative before. I could have done this uh, also with Python, but this is the point here. I want to stick with this uh, NumPy implementation and see what we can do when we parallelize the code. You see I have the import function here within the function because when we use IPython parallel, which I will do here, uh, the whole thing will be pickled and we have to import uh, within the function to get everything to the single workers. First, as a benchmark, of course, the sequential calculation. Um, this example is only about like calling for a couple of times the same, um, the same function and uh, parameterizing the function by different strike prices here in this case. But again, you can replace this with any function you're aware of, which is similar from your uh, specific area. And what we're doing here is kind of indeed just looping over the different strikes we're interested in and collecting the results that we get back from the function. Nothing special in this. A simple loop, collecting results, and we're finished. So you see here we do it for 100 of option calculations, and we get back the strikes, the list of strikes, and the results from our function. And in this case, the 100 calculations take 11.4 seconds. Just the results visualized that you get a feel. So going over the strikes, valuing a European call option means the higher the strike, the lower the value. This is what we would expect, so obviously the function works pretty well. Now the parallel calculation. What we use here, and there are many alternatives. I've seen already Celery, and I, I know that there will be a couple of talks about uh, alternatives, but IPython parallel usually, as I said, is kind of a low-hanging fruit. Many people are working uh, with IPython notebook these days, and uh, this is very well integrated. So we can just import from IPython parallel uh, our client class object here and instantiate the client in the background or using, for example, the IPython notebook dashboard. I should have fired up already kind of a, a, a either a local cluster or when working really in the cloud or uh, in cloud-based services, you can have huge clients. So the largest ones I've heard of were about like uh, 512 nodes. Uh, IPython parallel is known to be not that stable when it comes to like a thousand nodes, for example. So it doesn't really scale beyond a certain point. But still, for example, people doing research or for smaller applications is kind of a, a pretty efficient way. What I'm doing here, once I have uh, a client given my profile, my local cluster, for example, I generate a load balance view in this case. And the code that I need to do the same, what I've been doing before with the sequential calculation, it's just 
It's just almost the same. <laughs> They're kind of two differences, actually, worth mentioning. In this case, I don't directly call the function. I rather asynchronously apply my function, given the parameterization, to my view. I append the results and I have to wait until all the results have been returned, otherwise the whole thing will break down. So these are kind of only two lines, if you like, are attached in the code, and this is not even in the algorithm, this is just how I collect the results. So there's not that much overhead, uh, given the, the sequential implementation, we might have had three new lines and, and or four new lines in total, and one line of code has been changed um, to implement the different approach, actually, in this case. And the parallel execution, um, I'm a little bit surprised. Why does it take 29 seconds? And the wall time is not the right one. We have the, <laughs> we have the, the, I've been looking at the wall time. But the total time for the execution was uh, five seconds here, actually, in this case, um, because we have used multiple, uh, multiple cores. So it speeds up by a factor here where we are. We have started, let me get back, like 11 seconds and a little bit. Yes, 11.4 seconds. And we end up here on this machine at five seconds. Uh, a total time, but to have um, a little bit more rigorous comparison, I'll come back to the performance comparison by again applying my performance comparison function. Uh, but here you might have noticed that um, implementing this approach leads to different results, actually. Um, we don't get back kind of only the number. What we get back is the whole set of results and the metadata which the, the single jobs are returning. So for example, having a look at the metadata, you get back much more information, like when it was completed, when it was submitted, and so forth. But we are mainly interested, of course, in the result, and this can be retrieved via this attribute. We have this results object. Here's the attribute, and in the end, I can, here via another loop, collect all the single results from a parallel application um, of the algorithm. And just to compare here the sequential and the parallel calculation, of course, there are numerical differences because we are working with a numerical algorithm which implements simulation. So we would expect kind of numerical errors or differences, even if you're doing the same thing, be it parallel or sequential. But what we are most interested in is the performance comparison. And to this end, we have used the function already. And you see here working on a, on a machine with uh, four cores in it, leads to a speed up of roughly 3.1. So, of course, you have an overhead for distributing the jobs and so forth, for collecting your stuff. But in the end, you will see that applying this approach typically scales almost linearly in a number of cores. Not in a number of threads. Hyperthreading for these kind of uh, operations don't bring that much, but you will see usually, as I said, uh, uh, almost linear scaling in the number of uh, Workers, so for example, working with another server, we use these approaches with eight cores. Uh, um, there you see like kind of speed ups of seven times point something. But again, not that much overhead involved. No, we haven't changed the algorithm at all. And uh, by investing maybe an hour of work or whatever, uh, you might uh, improve your numerical computations considerably. If you're only working locally and are not interested in like spreading the parallelization over whole classes or whatever, then there's of course the built-in multi-processing module. Um, again, IPython parallel scales over small and medium-sized clusters, but sometimes it is helpful even to parallelize code on, on local machines. And, and I mean, I, I know the percentage, but most machines as of today, even the smallest notebooks have multiple cores. And, and even using two cores already might lead to significant speed ups. When you now think of a larger desktop machine where you have four or eight cores, you will see also significant improvements. And again, the fruits are low hanging in this case as well. So we import multiprocessing as MP, and our Example algorithm here is again Monte Carlo simulation. This doesn't do the valuation, but this doesn't do actually the same thing. Uh, it does the simulation. Um, so there's not that much of a difference. We have a different par parameterization here that we apply, but in the end it's kind of the same core algorithm that we use here to compare the performance. What this does is kind of gives us back simulated paths. In our case it will be stock prices, but also many, many um, things in, in the real world and physics and so forth are simulated that way. Uh, I mean, Brownian motion was uh, invented, so to say, in the first place uh, for describing the movement of particles in water. Um, so, I mean, it comes from physics, but the, the finance guys have adopted all the approaches uh, used in, in physics. So we are simulating paths over time, so to say. Um, what we now do here is kind of a little bit more 
let's say, a rigorous comparison or not rigorous, uh, but what we do is kind of we, we change the number of threads that we use for the multiprocessing implementation. We have kind of a test series, and it's, it's implemented on a notebook with four cores, i7, um, and we use the following parameters. We have 10,000 paths that we simulate, and the number of time steps is 10, and what we want to do is kind of 32 simulations, which translates to the number of tasks that have to be accomplished here in this case. Um, so it's a simple looping over a list object starting from one and ending to eight. So we start with a single thread and end with eight threads. And you see, there's not that much of code involved. It's actually pretty comparable to the, to the IPython uh, parallel example. You just have to define our pool of processes, our pool of workers that we use for the implementation. And then we map here in this case, there are different approaches, I must say, but here we map our function to a set of input parameters, actually. It works pretty much the same than the, than the map uh, function pro programming uh, uh, statement in Python. So we map our function to our set of parameters and say, well, please go ahead. And in the end, we wait uh, for the finishing and append the times that it takes for the single um, run C in this case. But as always, a picture says more than a thousand words. And you see here, we start for the 32 processes with the time approaching almost uh, 0.7 seconds, and we come down to, yeah, well, something about 1 point um, or 0 0.15 second, but you see multi-threading doesn't bring that much here in this case, uh, actually around uh, 4 or 5, actually here in this particular case at 5 we have the, the lowest execution time, but you see the, the, um, the benefits are pretty, pretty high here in this case, it, again, almost scales linearly with the number of cores available, not with the number of threads, but with the number of cores available here for our 32 Monte Carlo simulations. And as you've seen, it's only mainly two lines of code that accomplish the whole trick. Let me come to another approach. We haven't really touched the code, the implementation. We just have taken an implementation for the last two examples and have parallelized the thing. But more often than not, you want to try first to optimize what is actually implemented. And one very efficient uh, approach is dynamic compiling. There's available a library called Number. This is an open source NumPy aware optimizing compiler for Python code, which is developed and maintained by Continuum Analytics. And it uses the LLVM compiler infrastructure. And this makes uh, in a couple of um, application areas for really efficient uh, uh, yeah, let's <laughs> get, get uh, uh, the collecting of benefits and, and the low-hanging fruits that I've been mentioning so often right now. Um, that is almost like sometimes really surprising because we would see not that much effort, not that much overhead involved, but usually you can expect, given a certain type of problem, um, really high speed-ups. First introductory example before I come to a more realistic real-world example. Uh, and the example is only about counting the number of loops, but counting in a little bit like complex fashion, that we have to transcendental function uh, of cosine here and then calculate the logarithm. But in the end, this nested loop structure doesn't do anything else but counting the number of loops. So it's nothing about that. But we know looping on a Python level typically is expensive in terms of uh, performance and time spent. Uh, and we see it here when we parameterize this looping structure with 5,000 and 5,000. This takes about 10.4 seconds to execute. In the end, we have a looping, which shouldn't come as a surprise, um, over yeah, 25 million iterations here in this case. The benchmark, again, 10.4 seconds to remember. We can, of course, do a NumPy vectorized approach to accomplish the same result. Actually, it would make sense to like count only loops, but there are uh, typical uh, numerical and financial algorithms that are based on nested loops that you can easy, that, you, that are easily vectorized with NumPy. So this kind of very general and very powerful approach, but uh, we would see what the negative consequences are here in this case. Uh, again, the function is pretty compact in a sense that we just instantiate here our uh, array object, which is symmetric in, in this particular case, and we just do the calculation. We just do the summing over our resulting um, array object where we have applied before the logarithm and the cosine function, and then do the summing over the results. Here in this case, I mean, it's always uh, the same. <laughs> We're always coming up with the one, but nevertheless, it's compute intensive, and we see there's already a huge speed up. 
The execution time is below one second here in this case by using the vectorized approach. So NumPy, uh, as we know, is mainly implemented in C, where we are doing this kind of here. We like delegating the, the costly looping on a Python level to NumPy, and NumPy does it at a speed of C code, which is uh, a little bit faster, as we see here. Actually, we have a speed of more than 10 times. But there's one drawback. Instantiating such a huge array leads to memory requirements, of course. Here we see we need an array object which in the end consumes 200 megabytes of memory. And I mean, it's not, not kind of a nice feature. You have an algorithm which doesn't consume any memory, and here in this case, using NumPy and vectorization leads to a memory burn of 200 megabytes. And now think of kind of larger problems, and uh, you will certainly find some uh, where memory doesn't suffice in the end. So this is kind of nice because it's faster, but in the end it consumes lots of memory. Is memory not an issue? You might go that route, but there is an alternative actually, and this is number that I mentioned before. And again, the overhead is like kind of minimal in this case. I just import the library, usually abbreviated by NB, and call the JIT function for just-in-time compiling. I mean, it's not just-in-time, it's not compiled at runtime, it's compiled at call time, actually. Uh, but it's called JIT here in this case, and I don't do anything with the, with the Python function at all. So I just let the Python function as it is, the f underscore pi, and I generate a compiled version of it by using number. So now executing this, we see that when I call it for the first time, it's still not that fast, because for the first time I said it's compiled at call time. There is kind of a huge overhead involved, but when I call it for the second time, you see this is then ridiculously fast, given the Python implementation. So here we get to speeds where we say, well, now we can compare to C implementations to optimize C implementations, because number uses the LLVM infrastructure, and on the LLVM level, there are kind of these, all these uh, optimized compilers that like compile it optimally to the given hardware at hand. So this works as well, as I will show later on uh, with a different example, also on the GPU, actually. So here we see huge improvements in speed up, and again, I can only stress the point, uh, there's not that much effort involved, it's just the calling of the JIT to the original Python function. And here you see kind of huge, 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 huge uh, speed ups given this implementation. So it might be worth uh, considering using number when you have a, a similar problem where you see, oh, nested loops, and we do this and that and, and, and so forth. And the beauty is, uh, which comes on top, is that the number implementation is as memory efficient as the original one. There's no need to kind of uh, instantiate an NDRA object with 200 megabytes or even larger. Um, so the beauty of the memory efficiency remains and you get these huge improvements by just um, compiling it with number. Binomial option pricing is kind of a very popular, very important numerical algorithm in the financial world. So let's see if it works with that as well. Um, don't worry about the details. Again, it's just like a parameterization of the model. Um, what we have to do here is kind of simulate something then we calculate some inner values of an option and we do discounting. So we have kind of a three-step procedure, if you like. And the three steps are like illustrated here. I can do it maybe a little bit smaller. Uh, again, the code is not that important, but there are two points worth noting. The one is that I do the whole thing based on NumPy arrays. So I do, if you like, Python looping but based on NumPy arrays. So I'm not working on lists with Python loops. I have my Python NumPy and the array objects, and I do Python looping here over my arrays. And you see we have three nested loops to implement this when I, when I go the looping route. Um, this is not that I say you should do that, <laughs> uh, by no means, but uh, I will show the effect of uh, going different routes afterwards. Um, so just remember, looping over NumPy and the array objects, and we have three nested loops. And by now we should know that looping on the Python level should be costly. What does it mean costly? In this case, uh, the execution for a given number of time steps uh, takes 3.07 seconds. Actually, this binomial option pricing algorithm solves the same problem as we have been attacking before with the Monte Carlo simulation. So we can compare the result, and you see here the Monte Carlo simulation, which is usually considered to be the most expensive one when it comes to uh, computational power that is needed. It's even faster in that case. It's not that exact, I must say. There are numerical errors in there. But three seconds for the binomial option pricing model here compared to the 82 milliseconds given our Monte Carlo simulation from before. Um, but you see there are similar results that we get from the two 
uh, numerical methods. But it, this is actually the point, is just to say, well, these two algorithms solve actually the same problem, uh, in a sense. The first improvement, again, we can go the NumPy vectorization route. Uh, I said, well, I don't touch the algorithms themselves. I wouldn't say that I touch the algorithm here. This is just kind of uh, using different idioms, using different paradigms to do to implement the same algorithm in Python. And here we can make use, of course, again, of NumPy vectorization. Uh, is it two minutes left? Or? Oh, okay. Uh, can do the, the NumPy vectorization, actually. And um, what you see from the vectorization approach is, is a, that is, again, already much, much faster. But when we now apply the, uh, the uh, JIT from number, uh, and get back a compiled, a machine code compiled version of our Python one, uh, then you see that we again get a speed up of three times. Comparing this more rigorously, you see here, well, we have uh, the number version is 54 times faster in this case and three times faster than the number version. Let me skip through a, a couple of slides. There is a, a steady compiling example with Sison as well. Um, at this point, before I forget it, if you go to my Twitter feed, uh, DYGH, I have tweeted uh, the links to two presentations. Actually, this one I have also a side presentation, so you can read all the things um, to it. I'm going to do it right now, going to twitter.com, and it is uh, DYGH. And I have tweeted links to it, so I'm not able to present everything, but here you find the links to the presentations. Um, on my on my Twitter feed, actually, um, study compiling with Sison works uh, similarly. Um, here I have examples where you also get kind of huge improvements. I skipped through that in order to have uh, a couple of minutes left for questions. Uh, but again, if we do a performance comparison um, in this regard, for example, here I'm working with floats. So if you have a look at it, there's no need to work with floats. But still, uh, having this um, kind of rigorous performance comparison when you go through the algorithm back, you see I have uh, a, an implementation using Thyson and a, another one with number, and here in this case, they're actually pretty similar when it comes to performance. So with Thyson, you usually have to touch the code and you have to do kind of static declarations and so forth. Uh, but with number, sometimes, I don't say that always, don't get me wrong, but sometimes you can get uh, the same speed ups uh, by just using the, the just-in-time compiling uh, approach of JIT. Actually, the last topic is generation of random numbers on GPUs. I want to spend the last minute uh, on that because uh, this might be useful in many, many circumstances and usually it's considered kind of a, a very hard thing to get uh, the power of GPUs included in your work. What I'm using here is Number Pro, which is uh, a commercial library of continuum analytics, which is kind of the sister or brother uh, library of a number. And what I use is kind of the, the original, the, the, the native libraries that are provided in the CUDA lib in order to generate random numbers. Um, there's not that much specialties included. We just generate random numbers uh, uh, which are stored in a two-dimensional array in that sense. Uh, here's the code for the, for the CUDA function. Uh, CUDA only gives back like a one-dimensional array, so we have to reshape it afterwards, but I mean, this is straightforward. Uh, what we want to do here is kind of compare the performance for the different sizes of arrays that where we want to get uh, standard uh, normally distributed random numbers back. And I skipped the first slide because I have kind of implemented a rigorous uh, implementation. And what we see here in this one chart, and this almost says it already, that if you just want to generate a few random numbers, so to say, um, then you see that the CPU might be, might be the better one. Because you have overhead involved when you're moving data, when you're moving code from the CPU to the GPU, there's overhead, of course, but once you reach a certain size of the random number set, you see that the CPU is not a linear scaling, is it? but you see the increase in time needed, and you see that there's hardly any increase in the time needed on the, on the CUDA device here to generate the random numbers. Uh, here again, the message, if you have only a small set of random numbers, don't go to the GPU, there's too much overhead involved. Uh, remain on the CPU, uh, but again, if you're working with really large random number sets, and here the largest one that I'm generating is 400 megabytes in size per uh, random number set, then you see that, of course, the, uh, the uh, CUDA approach uh, pretty much well, yeah, of course, outperforms. Uh, the NumPy in-memory version uh, with the CPU based on the uh, based on the uh, the uh, CUDA approach here in this case. 
So again, only a couple of lines of code. It's a single library that you call and you get all the benefits from that and you see there's a, it's a huge speed advantage over the CUDA device over the NumPy one. The last thing I just want to mention is uh, hardware bound I.O. Python is not only when it comes to numerical operations, but I had it included in my abstract. Uh, Python is also pretty good when you want to harness the power of today's I.O. hardware. And usually it's pretty hard to get to the, to the speed limit of the hardware. But with Python and here working with an example uh, array object of 800 megabytes and just natively save that. You can also use your pi tables and HDF5 format and a couple of other things, but it's already built in into NumPy that you can save your arrays to disk. You see this almost at the speed of the, the hardware that is allowed. Here, writing on the MacBook uh, with SSD drive, you see for the 800 megabytes, this is much, much faster to save and to load, as you see, as it is to generate in memory. So the in-memory generation of this 800 megabyte array with the memory allocation and the calculation of the random numbers takes 5.3 seconds, but on this machine it only takes two seconds to write it and two seconds to read it. So you see how fast you can be with Python and there's no kind of performance trickery involved. This is just like batteries included and Python typically makes it, it pretty efficient and pretty easy to harness the power of the available hardware as of today. And this brings me to the end and thank you for your attention. Sorry to stay between lunch and. You just ask a question if you. I think I can hear you. I can repeat it. So thank you for the very dense, very nice overview of all the things. You made several comments on the the scaling. Of course, of course, yeah. Of course, this is, what is what I was saying. It's kind of for this particular algorithm, we have data parallelism and code parallelism. So this is kind of the, the most single, uh, simple scenario you can think of. Of course, I'm pretty aware of that. Yeah, they, of course. It's kind of one of the standard protocols that I use within. Uh, we haven't used it actually, but of course there are kind of uh, bindings and many application examples and pretty good use cases about that. Uh, okay, so hi, thanks for the talk, loved it. Um, small question, so suppose you were doing a huge time series analysis. It's not in this scope, but obviously that's something that's kind of hard to do in parallel. Um, there are algorithms that work very nice in parallel, and there's algorithms that don't work very nice in parallel. Uh, what's your gist on doing things with algorithms that don't work nice in parallel? Like, what's the, besides compiling, what are some tricks you maybe use? Just, this is a question out of curiosity. So actually, and I understood actually, time series analysis is of course one thing we are like concerned with all the day in finance, so it's one of my major things, so to say. But I, I didn't get the question in the end. Ah, uh, what uh, you were... so, so there are algorithms that, are, that you can really easily port to something parallel, and there are algorithms where this is not so easy. And yeah. I can imagine for certain like very advanced uh, time series models, say ARIMA type of models, uh, those don't parallelize that nicely. Uh, what are your... What's your gist on if the problem is hard to parallelize, what's the best tactic to approach those problems? I mean, of course, not, not everything is kind of well suited to be parallelized. What we're using, for example, or working heavily with kind of least squares Monte Carlo, where you need kind of the cross section. Usually, in Monte Carlo, you would say 100,000 paths, I can parallelize into two times 50,000 paths. It's the same with the time series analysis. You could do like, I have. 100,000 observations, I, I can implement my algorithm on the first 50,000 and then the second 50,000. Yeah. This is one approach to do it. Uh, but not every algorithm is like, well, sweetie, because you need kind of the whole history or whatever built up. So you, you need the cross section of the information in order to have your yeah, algorithm exactly. produce the results that it's supposed to produce. So usually, I mean, the approach that I present is kind of uh, using parallelization for an unoptimized algorithm is kind of usually not the way to go. The, what you would do in this case when you say, well, I don't have the algorithm that can be 
pretty easily parallelized. Of course, you would in any case go for the optimization of your algorithm by using Thyson and everything. But I think all the libraries, there's not only Thyson. Uh, what I haven't mentioned is kind of Theano. For example, if you have a look at PyMC3, uh, this makes heavy use of Theano, uh, just in time compiling, where kind of your objects, your classes are like on the fly, dynamically optimized for the problem given at hand using just in time compiling. Or, call time compiling. It's kind of a slight difference. Uh, but this is typically, I think, the approach that you would take. They say, well, let's first optimize with any given means that we have available uh, the algorithms. But I agree, not every algorithm is kind of well suited to be parallelized. But again, if you have two time series to analyze, then you can start yeah, right. uh, thinking about that again. And this was my, my point, actually. Let me think similarly. Many Thanks. similar similar tasks. And this is, of course, the trivial case uh, for parallelization. So if you're starting off with serial Python code, I think it's pretty obvious that using these um, parallel tools will make it go faster. But um, I think lots of people believe that Python is not what you should be using if you want to have efficient parallelization because of the additional overhead, because you have to use multiprocessing because of the gill, and obviously Python is a higher level language. So I'm not talking about benchmarks, but just in real world applications, like actual applications that you have written, what do you say to people who would be tempted to stick with C++ to squeeze out that last bit of performance? Like, do you find that Python is sufficient for kind of everyday needs for these kinds of simulations? So far, we haven't ever gone the route of going to C++ or C. For all our client projects, nor for the things that we've been implementing. So we're using, for example, the multiprocessing tool for DX Analytics, our library, where we have simple, easy scaling and, and, and parallelization on the machine, at least. But this is typically where the things are run, uh, on larger machines with multiple cores with huge memory. This is kind of the scenario that I have. I mean, many, many... I can understand people that have issues like with the scaling over like clusters and so forth, but of course, I mean, the, 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 you have this word, and with Thyson is kind of the, the very good example where you can say, well, even using Thyson, I can decide whether I have 90% Python and 10% C, so to say, or I have something that looks like 90% C and a little bit of Python you can still notice in between. So, and this is the beauty of Python that you don't have usually these either or things. You can even go for like, after profiling, where I say, well, this is the real bottleneck of the whole thing. Let's go for the C route for that. I recently met during our Python for Quant Finance meetup in, in London, a guy, he said, well, I, I again did something in Assembler because we thought this would be, I don't know if this is the right thing. But still, you have the flexibility and, and uh, there's a beauty of Python that is not either or, that it integrates pretty well. And of course, C and C++ are the two worlds where Python interacts natively with. So whenever you say, well, I have this approach and I can use this better with C++, why not going that? So many people are doing that and the financial industry is kind of a standard to do that. But we, for the things we have been doing, I can only say it again, for our stuff and for stuff that we have been implementing for uh, our clients, we've always stuck to the Python. But of course, using performance libraries and all that, I mean, under the hood, this comes down to C and, and other stuff, but not on the, on the top level where we've been implementing things. Thank you. Thank you.